Good morning and thank you for joining us at Highway Online. If this is your first time joining us this morning or you've joined us for the past couple of weeks, we want to get to know you better and welcome you in a more personal way. So I ask that you would text the word welcome to our church phone number, which is 416-267-1189. If you want to join us on the YouVersion Bible app with today's teaching notes and scriptures, you can do that by opening up your Bible app on your cell phone. You can search in, in the event section, Highway Gospel Church, and that will pull up all the scriptures so you can read along and join us this morning together. If you need prayer this morning during our live stream or at any point during the week, you can go to our Facebook page. At the very top, there's a button that says send message. Click that and that will send a message to one of our staff and team members who can pray with you right on the spot. If you're watching our live streaming service through our um, website page, there is a button that says live prayer right at the bottom of that page and you click that and it will directly send you to a staff member right now who's ready to pray with you and encourage you. The comment section is open on both Facebook and our live streaming platform and I just really encourage you to talk to one another, ask how you're doing, ask where one of you or all of you are watching from and that's a great way to connect um, with everybody who's watching live with you and with us this morning. This morning, we're going to partake in communion together, so if you don't have your emblems ready, I would suggest that you pause this or go right now and get your juice, your crackers, your bread, your water, whatever you're using to take communion. And remember, we're going to do that shortly um, as a family together. Before we give it over to Pastor Dan for today's message, we're going to pray together. So let's pray. Lord, we're just so thankful that through this crazy time, we can come and meet with you virtually together as a family. Lord, I pray that you would be with us this morning. Father, I pray that today's message and your words would just seep into our souls, oh God. I pray that you would transform our thoughts and our minds this morning by the power of your word and the message that Pastor Dan has for us. Lord, I pray that you would come and fill our space, come and fill our rooms, our homes, our bedrooms, wherever we're watching or listening to this, oh God, would you come and take over. Lord, I pray that you would be with us this morning and that today's message would resonate in our spirits. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy today's message. Good morning, and thanks once again for being with us this morning. Before we turn the service over to Pastor Dan, I do want to share just a few announcements with you as a reminder of what's going on here at Highway during this time. Again, a reminder that our devotionals are still available or are back available this week on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays through our social media on Facebook, uh, our Facebook page, and on Instagram. Uh, Tuesday and Thursday are video devotionals. Wednesday is a written devotional for you. Please check those out. You don't have to be on in the morning. The videos and the written stay up there for quite a while, so you don't have to worry if you can't get to it in the morning. As well, small groups are still meeting. If you want to join a small group, just reach out to us here at the church. You can either phone us at 416-267-1189, or you can email us highway at highwaygospel.ca, and we'll get you the information you need. And if you're in a small group and you want to know what's going on, you can reach out to your leader and they will let you know as well uh, over the summer here as we commence summer scheduling and, and so on. As well, if you want to know what's going on here at Highway during this time, you can go to our website, highwaygospel.ca, click on the online community page, the button, and it'll take you to our page and all the information you need about anything from kids, youth, through to adults will be there for you to um, know what's happening here as well and finally we just want to today thank all of you who are supporting the church who are continue to continue to give and worship us and worship not worship us and worship by giving to to the church we thank you for that we want to remind you there are three ways to give first and for well not first and foremost first you can send a check to the church please don't send cash through the mail you can use the online tithely app or you can go to the church website, again, highwaygospel.ca, and click Give there. And we thank you for your continued support. We just want to remind you at this time that ministry is ongoing at Highway, so your support is very much appreciated, including stuff like Church in Regent Park, which we will be um, doing again next weekend. We don't need volunteers at this time because of the way they're running things, but we are still 
taking and donating uh, dessert to them during this time. This will be our second time since COVID hit. So if you want to help us there and help support that ministry, you can just uh, mark your giving to that as Church in Regent Park or CIRP for those of you who want to do it shorter, and we'll make sure it gets designated to that. Now would be a great time as we turn it over to open your Uversion app, and I hope you have a great morning and a great day. God bless you. Good morning. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. And just before I get to our sermon today, which concludes our series on 1 Kings chapter 17, I just wanted to share something with you. Just under a year ago, last fall, when we were gathering together in the highway building, I had taken a week and I had talked about the concept of blessing your neighbor or bless your neighbor. Uh, I refer to it as an acronym. It's an acronym that I did not come up with. It's one that I found that another pastor named Dave Ferguson had written. And I've been thinking about that the last few days, and I just wanted to bring that to our memory as a church and as people of faith, that as we begin to see these, the the issues in the pandemic begin to loosen. So the restrictions are slowly coming down and we are slowly moving ourselves towards whatever the next steps and phases are going to be. And as we're doing this, I thought this is a great time for us as people of faith to begin to bless our neighbors. They could be the people living right next door to you. They could be the people that you have friendships with for a long time. They could be co-workers. But I want to remind you about that acronym BLESS. uh, They stand for something. So the first letter stands for for BEGIN. BEGIN with prayer. And, And from that we move to listen to their story. See, before we have the right to speak into somebody's life with the faith that we want to share with them. We need to to be part of their life. So we begin with prayers, we pray for them, and then we listen to the story, we begin to get to know them. And then this next one in in the acronym is a little hard right now, it's eat with them. A lot of restrictions, restaurants uh, can't go out for a coffee easily unless they've got a patio. Uh, But Even as we begin to lift and people are longing for relationship with others and just friendship with people, begin to see that, find some creative ways that you could eat with them. And then you want to serve them, especially now coming in the lighter restrictions of the pandemic. What can we do to help our neighbors? Maybe we can still go to the store, pick up groceries for them, or, or, or run and get some supplies for them. Offer, um, call them, knock on their door, walk by and you see them outside, say, you know, just wondering if there's anything I could help you with. And once we do all this, it'll begin to open the door so we could share our story with them, or we can share the hope we have. We're living coming into this and out of this pandemic. We're living in a time where people have been frightened and and some are still worried. Uh, They're not sure what the future holds. And and we want to share the hope of the future that we know and have. And so let's take some time over this next number of weeks, over these next summer months as summer begins to unfold, a different summer than we originally thought, but summer nonetheless. Let's see if there's ways that we could bless our neighbors. All right? Just wanted to make you aware of that. All right? And remind you about that. Now I want to turn our attention to the conclusion. We've been in this short series on 1 Kings chapter 17, looking at the life of Elijah and how he was originally sent to King Ahab. He, he told, people, uh, told the king and the people that God is sending a drought because of the sin of Israel. Uh, last week we, we saw that miracle, how a widow's empty jar never emptied how there's enough flour to keep going through the drought. And and so far in this story, we've learned a couple of great truths. We've learned that it's in the quiet and sometimes lonely places of life that we find God and we're drawn closer to him. We learned that we need to trust God even when we don't understand what's happening. (laughs) Isn't that true today? That God is asking you to give him whatever you have. You might think it's little, but God can make it a lot. And God is looking for your faithfulness and your obedience. And so we begin today by looking at 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 17. We're told this, Sometime later, 
the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my son, sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Story begins that some time later. There's a break between verse 16 and 17 that, that we don't readily see. So if you were with us last week, we talked about the, uh, the flour and oil that God provided for the widow, for her son, and for Elijah throughout the, the famine. And we're told it lasted, never ran empty throughout the famine, the drought rather, um, which led to famine, but the drought, which we now know lasted three and a half years. And then we're told right the next verse, some time later. So there's a large break between verses 16 and 17. And, and some scholars believe that break could be somewhere in the, in the vicinity of a two-year break. So that's how long that we don't hear a whole lot. And time has passed. And every day, the jar that was almost empty was never empty. There was always food for another day. This miracle is taking place. And now we've gone a couple of years. And there's also a reference here made to the upper room where Elijah stayed. I just want to give you the background here. And so you need to understand that Elijah lived with this widow and her son, but in the east of that time, he didn't necessarily live in her home. The homes had flat roofs, and many, many times it was customary to have a room on the roof. It was separate from the house, but literally on the house. And there would be stairs on the outside, probably up the side of one side, going to the rooftop. And it would probably be a good-sized room, not, not cramped and tiny. And, and that's where the prophet Elijah lived throughout this this drought. And as he stayed with the widow and her son, he really stayed on her building, but not in her home. And so this was done for a number of reasons. It was customary to have a room like that. The, the outside staircase provided security for the widow that nobody could misjudge the way she spoke or lived her life, that the strange man wasn't living with her. He was living in the room upstairs, and he had access that didn't have to bother her. She had access to her house, didn't have to bother him. And so that's what it means in the upper room where Elijah stayed. And as the story begins to unfold here, the widow comes to Elijah in great distress. She's carrying her son. The idea is that her son is, is probably not a teenager. He's still young enough to be carried. He's not an infant or a toddler or that little, but he's big enough that she could carry him, but not too big that she can't carry him. And, and she carries her son, and she walks over to Elijah, the prophet. She says, what are you doing? See, my son has become ill, and he died. This widow's already had a difficult life. Her husband has died, left her with a young son. She's now been living through a drought. If you remember from last week's, the earlier part of this chapter, if you weren't with us last week, that she was almost out of food. She was ready to make one last meal and die. She was at a state of hopelessness when she meets Elijah for the first time. And she comes to Elijah carrying her son who's dead in her arms and she says, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my son, sin and kill my son? This, this is the grief of a mom losing a son. The widow is really saying in her way and in her, her own words, why did you bother to come here? I thought you were here to rescue us through this drought, but instead you've brought calamity on me. I did not need you to come and offer me hope. For even in this season, and now you make it worse by allowing me to live the rest of my life without my son. It was one thing for my son and I to die together, but now you're going to take my son from me? And then she makes reference to her sin. Now, we understand that this is not a specific sin. It's not like she says, oh, I'm being judged because I did this or I did that. But she's talking about sin in general. And, and somewhere in her mind, she's, she's thought, well, just maybe. 
Maybe this prophet, this man of God has come and he's been a guest at my home for such a long time and he's aroused the presence of the Holy God in my life and in my home and God is unhappy with me because there's sin in my life in general and I'm now being judged for my sin. Why? Why have you judged me for my sin? Now, excuse me. Now notice Elijah doesn't answer the widow's question. I mean, literally, how can he? What's he to say to this? Instead, he takes the boy from her arms and he carries him up to his room. See, there are times in our lives when things happen that feel like death to us. We have questions that can never seem to have a satisfactory answer or any answer. And Elijah unlocks the secret right here that we need to learn to take the question to God. Have you done that? Have you been walking through a season of life where you feel like that which you have treasured for so long has suddenly been taken from you? Have you been wondering why it feels like God has turned on you? Have you stopped believing before the answer came? Did you give up on God because his timing did not match your timing. See, the story continues in verse 20. Then he cried out. Let's do that again, verse 20. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. Elijah called out to God. He's agonizing for the life of this boy. And the pain of his mother as he sees it in her eyes, Elijah has a moment of uncertainty and and misunderstanding. Lord, why did you send me here to this widow in this foreign land? You've provided for us all this time through the miracle of flour and oil that haven't run out. And now, Lord, you've allowed her son to die. There's agony going on in his heart. Elijah, the Bible says, Elijah puts the boy on his bed and then he stretches himself out over the boy. Now, it's quite a a scene if you could imagine it in your mind. That here lies... This lifeless boy who I'm sure Elijah has had an opportunity to get to know living in that home and on that home for so long. His heart is breaking as the mother is. You probably hear her crying downstairs. And he lies out on top of him, arms over arms, legs over legs as he gets over him. And I want you to know that he's praying with all his might. He's saying, God, put life back in this little boy's body. I want you to know that Elijah did that and nothing happened. We read that real quickly in those verses if you you caught it. And so Elijah would go and he would do it a second time. He'd stretch out over the boy and he'd call on God and say, God, bring life back to this little boy. The Bible says nothing happened over and over twice he's done this and then for a third time Elijah gets out over that boy and he stretches out and he calls out to God let this boy's life return to him and then verse 22 says this very words the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived How many times have you prayed long and hard and there seemed to be no answer? Elijah prayed not once, not twice, but three times for God to hear him. And here's the prophet, the man of God. You and I would think, man, he would just think it and it would happen. Three times he had to call on God. How many times have you called on God and you thought he did not hear you? How many times did you wonder if God even cared about you? How many times... Did you pray and pray and pray and then you stopped praying because nothing seemed to happen because you gave up too soon? How many times did you stop just short of receiving the answer? 
The story reminds us that we should never give up on God. We should never lose hope and we should never stop believing. And maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, but pastor, you don't know. You don't know how long I've been praying for a loved one to know Jesus. You don't know. You don't know that I'm tired of waiting on God for the answer. But pastor, you don't know how many times I've cried out to God and it feels like he's not hearing me. It feels like my prayers don't even get past the ceiling. You don't understand. You don't know that it's been easier since I gave up. Really, it has. Really, has it? Because you're kind of still wondering, God, where are you? Have you really given up? Or have you just grown tired? See, the story reminds us that nothing is impossible with God. Understand this, the boy was dead. His mother knew it. The prophet knew it. God knew it. But that's not the end of the story. The mother was desperate. The prophet was determined. And God is able. You see, the things that you thought were dead, the things that you thought were hopeless, the things that you thought were impossible are changed when you dare to see that God is able. What circumstance in your life needs to have the breath of God breathed into it? What do you need to give God today? What situation do you need to cry out and say, God, breathe life into this situation? The story goes on in verse 23. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room to the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. So we're told Elijah picks the boy up off his bed. He's now breathing and living. And he carries him down. I I don't understand why he didn't walk, but he carries him down into the house and he presents him to his worried and frightened mother. And he simply claims, look, your son is alive. By the way, if you're wondering or if you've noticed, this is the first recorded story of a resurrection in the Bible. And the woman declares, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. What what is this woman doing? She She is expressing a statement of faith in Jehovah God. She acknowledges that truth is to be found in the God given words of the prophet Elijah. And when the prophet speaks the words of God, God is the one who backs them up. Remember, A little earlier in the story. Remember when the widow cried out. Remember when she said, why have you done this? When she thought God had turned on her. When all she saw was the death of her son. She thought, once again, everything was hopeless and everything was dead. Her questions seemed to have no answers. And God must have seemed so far away from her. But here we are, just a little time later, God has heard her cry. God has seen her loss, and God has turned death into life. See, God brings life from what we think is dead. Those things in your life that you thought were dead, if you would only give them to God, if you would only trust God with them, then you will see that God is able to bring you life from death. The dreams you thought were dead are only dormant. The hope you thought you lost can be found again. The faith you thought was weak can be strengthened once more. God is asking you to trust him, even when it seems that everything is going wrong. Have you basically given up on God? Have you reached the point where you say to yourself, why? Should I bother anymore? Why? Maybe you've thought, you know, I've given my life to Jesus. I've tried to live by his word, but everything seems to be going wrong. You need to understand we serve Jesus because he loved us and died for us. First, it's about what Jesus did for you. 
Jesus loved you enough to go to the cross and die. The reality of Jesus' sacrifice is that you get to live life with the presence of God in this world. We all face difficulties. We all face hard times. We all face trying situations. And we have a God in heaven who loves us and cares for us and walks with us through the hard times. When it seems that everything is going wrong, God is asking you to trust him, to put your faith in him. And regardless of how the situation turns out, God will always be with you. God is asking you today, are you willing to trust him? Are you willing to put your faith in him? Are you willing to believe that the things that God speaks are truth? Are you willing to believe that the things that Jesus said about himself are true? Are you willing to trust him? Are you willing to live with him and for him? Let's pray. Father, we just bow our hearts before you today. We are so thankful for this story. For the fact that this story reminds us that you are the God who is able. This story reminds us that all is not lost and all is not hopeless. That you are the God who brings life out of death. You are the God who turns situations around. You are the God who gives us hope in the place of our hopelessness. So we thank you for that. And Jesus, we thank you for what you did dying on the cross for us. For your love, your love allowed our forgiveness to take place. And we thank you for that. And we give you all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we move on with the service, I just want to pause. And if you've been listening to this story about Elijah and the widow's dead son who's now alive. If you've been listening to that and you've been wondering about God and trusting God, and maybe you're, you're saying to yourself, you know what? I need to have life with Jesus. I need to start living for God. I want you to reach out to us. I want you to text the word love to 416-267-1189. One one eight nine. If you text love, it's going to ask you for your name and contact info. I want to be in touch with you, and I want to be able to help you as you begin a relationship with God, as you begin following Jesus in this life. So don't be shy. Just reach out to us. I'm the only one who's going to get that. So go ahead and do that, and I want to be in touch with you. And just before we conclude our service today, we reminded you earlier that we want to have a time of communion and, and it just seems so appropriate with the way this story ends up with the hope, the hope of death into life. And that's the same kind of hope that Jesus gives us. You see, Jesus died on the cross and three days later he rose again. And he rose and died and rose again so that our sins could be forgiven. And Jesus did it because he loved us. And the night before he was arrested and then taken away, eventually to be crucified, Jesus gathered with his disciples, and, you know, we call it the, uh, the, the Last Supper. And he took some of the elements out of the Passover meal, and he, uh, one of them was an unleavened bread, and he took it and he, he broke it. And uh, he broke it and he said, these words, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so if, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you desire to live your life in obedience to Jesus' teachings, then we invite you to celebrate this communion with us. Use whatever elements you have at home. I have like a cracker and some juice. You could have bread and water. It'll be fine. And, and Jesus took that bread and he broke it. He said, do this in remembrance of me. If you take that bread right now, would you just take it and eat together? Later in the same 
dinner with his disciples, Jesus took a cup of wine. He said to the disciples, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And you see, Jesus' blood allows our sins to be forgiven. Jesus' blood paid the price for your sin and my sin and our sin. And Jesus did it because he loves us, because he loves you and he cares for you. So if you have, would you drink and remember? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you cared enough about us to send Jesus to this world. And Jesus, we thank you that you died on our behalf. You died for the forgiveness of my sin. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for what you've done. May we not take it for granted. May we not forget. But every day would we remember Every time that we can take communion, can we be thankful? And we thank you right now. Would you just keep your eyes closed for a moment with me? And I'm just wondering right now if there's anybody who would say, Pastor, there's a need in my body. I have a physical need. I, I'm fighting illness or sickness. Or, or maybe you have an emotional need. Or, or maybe you need a miracle right now in your life. If that's you, I'm going to ask you right now to agree with me in faith that you would believe with me right now and for God because God is able. He sees your need. He sees your situation. He knows everything that you're facing and he loves you in it and through it and he'll, he'll walk through it with you. I want to just pray for you right now. Father, I thank you right now that we can call on you and I ask today, Father, that you would touch those who, who need a healing. Jesus, that by your power, people will receive the miracles that they need. Lord, that you would begin to turn situations around, that you would begin to turn hopelessness into hope, that you would bring life out of places that look dead. We give you all the glory and all the honor. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today at Highway Online. I trust that you've enjoyed these stories of 1 Kings chapter 17. I want to remind you that we're going to be here again next week. Our small groups are meeting through the week. And if you are new to Highway Online, this is one of your first times, would you reach out to us? Would you text the word welcome to 416-267-1189 and again follow the prompts and I will reach out to you and I want you to know that I am so grateful that you took time to be with us today. Have a great day. Have a great week. Be blessed.